The Home Office confirms many child refugees are found to be over 18 years old. A Tory MP prompts protests as he calls for more stringent checks on those arriving from Calais. What we shouldn't do is allow that, uh, that great um, well of hospitality that we have in Britain to be abused by people who, who are claiming to be children when they're not. Apart from anything else, it's going to make it harder for us to help the people who genuinely need it. Also this lunchtime, a former pensions minister tells ITV News it'll cost Sir Philip Green hundreds of millions of pounds to put his money where his mouth is on VHS. Hours away from a Mars landing that may answer the vexed question about life on the Red Planet. And three hours and 56 minutes is a marathon record if you're 85 years young. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Alistair Stewart. Good afternoon. What began as an act of humanity has descended into a bitter row. Britain's pledge to allow refuge to some of the children in the Calais camp has prompted accusations that some are cheating about their age. One Tory MP has called for dental checks. The Home Office admits there is a problem. Two-thirds of the asylum claims it queried indeed proved to be over 18. But the charity Citizens UK says an act of humanity is getting lost in nastiness and bureaucracy. Here's our deputy political editor, Chris Shipp. There were more arrivals this morning at the Home Office Centre in South London where the refugees are being assessed. All male, all young, but a question mark hangs over how young, under 18 or over, and how to work out who is and is not eligible to come to the UK. Some MPs and newspapers have been accused of vilifying these refugees from the migrant camp in Calais, claiming many are in their 20s or 30s and are breaking Home Office rules. One Conservative MP said this morning they should be subject to medical tests of teeth or of bones. There are two tests that are already in use at the moment across the world, including America, Australia and I think 16 out of 22 European countries. Uh, the main one is a dental check. On, um, on teeth, but also there's, a, there's an x-ray on the wrist that can be done as well to check bone density. So either of those two tests will give um, a fairly accurate assessment of people's ages. The migrant camp in Calais, most often referred to as the jungle, is facing demolition by the French. Bulldozers may move in here within weeks. Those coming to the UK are part of an official resettlement programme. But even Home Office figures confirm there are some fraudulent attempts. More than a 1,000 applications were disputed last year on the grounds of age. 900 went through to an assessment and the majority of those, 636, were deemed to be over 18. The reason why they look so haggard and old is, you know, when we first raised their cases a year ago with the Home Office, they got a clear legal right to reunite with their families and they've been left languishing up until now, risking their, nights, their lives basically daily on train tracks on the one hand or falling into the hands of people traffickers on the other. So of course they look pretty haggard. A couple of the people in shop we think actually might be translators who are accompanying the boys. So I think there's probably a bit of hysteria about this. The Home Office would not confirm to us if any of those on today's front pages were translators. Downing Street will only say the Prime Minister has confidence in the system. Chris Shipp, ITV News. Well, Rebecca Barry is live at the centre in Croydon. Chris was talking about where those refugees are first taken when they arrive from Calais. So, Rebecca, what sort of checks are these people being put through? Well, it, it was around an hour and a half ago that the coach arrived and 12 people, they all looked like teenage boys, walked off and stepped into this Home Office building. Uh, for many, it will have been the final stage in a long and traumatic journey across Europe to find safety. In Calais, they will have already been interviewed by both French and UK officials to determine their age and any who didn't have official documentation would have been judged on their physical appearance and their demeanour. Now inside this building, they're being screened and assessed and that will improve uh, that will include having their fingerprints taken and there's also the option for an additional check on their age and that would be done by the local authority. It would have to comply with the law and would have to be approved by at least two social workers. The Home Office stressed that they do not use dental x-rays to determine the age of anyone seeking asylum and they quote a description of that as inaccurate, inappropriate and unethical. Rebecca, thank you.
A former pensions minister's told ITV News it will cost the former BHS owner, Sir Philip Green, hundreds of millions of pounds to rescue the store's pension scheme. Baroness Ros Altman said that she believed Sir Philip means what he says after he told ITV News that he was sad and very sorry over the collapse and vowed to fix the crisis. Paul Davis reports. How sad and very, very, very sorry I am. Yesterday, a sorry Sir Philip Green told ITV News he was close to putting right the mess that is the BHS Pensions Fund. We are in very strong dialogue with the regulator um, for a solution. The commitment I made at the Select Committee stands. I said I would do my best and to find a solution and that's what we continue to do. Today, the man who represents the BHS pensioners was asked by MPs how close he was to a solution. Is there a concrete proposal on the table? Uh, there's not a concrete, a single concrete proposal in front of the trustee at the moment. If that doesn't sound so good, there was this vote of confidence for Sir Philip Green from a former pensions minister. Well, I actually believe he meant what he said and I hope that he will come up with enough money to make sure that uh, his former workers get more than they would have got from the Pension Protection Fund, which will mean him putting in a significant sum of money into the pension scheme. That sum of money, Baroness Altman says, will be hundreds of millions of pounds from Sir Philip's personal fortune. Yesterday, the billionaire talked about the hurt he and his family had felt with the criticism of his sale of BHS. I and my family have got to live with this horrid decision and trust me these are not fun days um, I've been doing this as you said a very 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 long time mm. um, and sadly it's all suddenly sort of squeezed into you know the only thing in the world is in, in the world is BHS this has been a horrible 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 period Susan Alec knows what a horrible time really feels like after 35 years working for BHS you know, I joined the pension scheme as a little 16 year old back in 1981 and you know you were given advice of join the pension scheme it will look after you in, year, in later years and unfortunately the way that it stands at the moment there is so much uncertainty of what is going to happen to our pensions at the moment. There's not a lot left of the company that gave Susan and thousands like her a career. Now she must wait to see if promises turn into a decent pension. Paul Davis. ITV News. And our business editor Joel Hills joins me live in the studio. Promises turning into a decent pension. How quickly do you think this can be resolved? Well, on the first point, uh, it could be resolved on uh, almost any time. It could be resolved today if, it, uh, if Sir Philip Green is minded to. He knows exactly what the pension regulator wants, what it's looking for. Uh, they've just got to, he's just got to agree, <laughs> agree to sign the cheque and effectively. There are complexities. When Sir Philip Green yesterday said he wanted to save the scheme from the pension fund and pointed to the fact there are a lot of moving parts, he wasn't wrong. There are things that need thrashing out that do take time. However, at the end of the day, fundamentally, this is about money, Alistair. Uh, and all sides agree that Sir Philip Green has to come up with a sufficient amount of cash to keep the scheme running for about 50 years and deliver on all those promises that it has made to the 20,000 uh, members of the scheme. Now, the deficit officially £571 million. It won't cost anything like that uh, for Philip Green uh, to fund it on an ongoing basis, but it will cost, I think, well north of £200 uh, million. Talks are ongoing. They cannot go on, though, indefinitely. We know that the pensions regulator is conducting an anti-avoidance investigation, trying to establish, Alistair, if it thinks that Sir Philip Green, when he sold BHS, retained a financial obligation to support the pension fund. They'll conclude that investigation by the the end of November and they have made it very clear that if the there isn't a settlement with Sir Philip Green by the end of November then they intend to use their recovery powers to reclaim the money so watch this space I think it will be resolved perhaps today more likely in a matter of weeks all right Joel thank you thousands of people have fled Mosul as the battle to retake the Iraqi city from so-called Islamic State continues. Over 5,000 people have already crossed the border into Syria since Peshmerga forces, backed by a US-led coalition, began their advance to liberate IS's last stronghold in Iraq on Monday. Two First World War soldiers whose bodies laid unburied for more than a century have been laid to rest with full military honours. Privates William Marmon, 21, 
and Harry Carter, 20, died in the Somme on November the, in November 1915. Headstones bearing their name had wrongly been placed in the Commonwealth War Games Commission Cemetery in France, but as Sally Lockwood explains, their remains were actually discovered a century later in the place where they fell. More than a hundred years after they fell here in northern France, a funeral with full military honours. <laughs> Attending the ceremony, the great nephews of the two British soldiers who died, both treasuring the flags that were draped on their great uncle's coffins. Well, yeah, it's a sort of a memento, isn't it? Of what, of what he went through. And it wasn't in vain in the end. I mean, you've got to keep these things up because you, know, you, can't, forget, you can't forget these people. Yeah, I feel very privileged to be here. Yeah. Their great uncles were Private Harry Carter, who was just 20 years old, and 21 year old Private William Marmon, killed along with six others from 10th Battalion, the Essex Regiment, in 1915. Their deaths were marked at the time. Graves incorrectly bearing their names were laid here in the fog of war. But in fact, their bodies had remained buried here beneath this landscape. At half past one on the morning of the 22nd of November 1915, the Germans detonated an enormous mine, a 15 tonne mine, 80 feet below ground. And the resultant spoil, this huge crater, came up and buried our eight men of the 10th Battalion Essex Regiment. The men's skeletons were found along with their regiment's shoulder badges. And letters written in the trenches by Harry Carter have been handed to the team that found him. Here we have a letter to his mum and dad just 17 days before he was killed on the Western Front. And it talks about the sort of weaponry that the Germans are, are deploying against the British troops and how the place where he is is aptly named as Devil's Corner. But now, lying in a peaceful corner of northern France, these two brave men have finally been laid to rest. Sally Lockwood, ITV News. Still to come a major day on Mars as Europe scientists attempt to land their first robot successfully. And still breaking records why this runner's harder than ever to keep up with, even aged 85. First in the United States, Democrats and Republicans have been engaging in a frantic few hours of campaigning ahead of tonight's third and final televised presidential debate in Las Vegas. Once again, it's Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump, of course. At a rally in Colorado, Trump accused the election of being corrupt. They even want to try and rig the election at the polling booths, where so many cities are corrupt and voter fraud is all too common. There is no serious person out there who would suggest somehow that you could even you could even rig America's elections. I'd advise Mr. Trump to stop whining and go try to make his case to get votes. The odds on Donald Trump winning the election do seem to be lengthening. This map is based on the latest opinion poll results, which suggest the states are pretty evenly split between Trump and Clinton. But the president is chosen by electoral college votes win the state and you get all the votes, the total number determined by the population of the state. 270 electoral votes are needed to win and this latest estimate puts Clinton well ahead on 304 to Trump's 138. We should know the real result three weeks today. And I'm delighted to be joined now by political scientist Dr. Gina Yanatel Reinhardt from the University of Essex. We have great caution in this country, I'm sure, in the <laughs> States as well, about polling. But in your view, is Trump done for? He's not done for, but he's at the very end. And there are very few uh, things that could actually take him out of this situation. One would be if Hillary Clinton has some sort of terrible scandal or awful revelation that comes out about her, which it wouldn't be unheard of for people in Trump's camp to put forward or try to perpetrate. Um, the other thing, though, is that Regardless of that, he really, really needs to win the debate tonight, mm. just 
absolutely hands down win the debate. Intriguingly, on debate one and two, and I'm one of the many crazies who stayed up that late to watch it, when he was having a go at big government and you've had all this time to put things right, he tracked well. Mm -hmm. People like that. Is this a love that dare not speak its name? The Trumpsters just don't want to do it publicly, but they're going to vote for him. It is quite possible. And one of the other things that would have to happen for him to win would be that all of the margins of error would need to tip in his favor. And it's possible that that could happen if there are people who are lying or just afraid to tell the polls what they really believe they're going to do. Yeah. You said, just to turn it back on its head, and we like balance a lot as well, talking about uh, Hillary Clinton, something worse to break out. I mean, the Benghazi story and the emails and saying, oh, I don't know about security, and then proving that she does. Right. Is there something worse than that hovering? I don't think there is. No, I don't think there is. And uh, this is a person who's had almost the last 30 years of her life non-stop scrutinized by the press and the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. I don't think there's a chance there's anything else. Final point, and we followed so closely the allegations about his inappropriate, lewd language about right. women. And, of course, Hillary, as a candidate, is also a woman. In the United States of America, demographics, does that play big? Yes, it will. Uh, there are a lot of people in the U.S. who don't believe that a woman should be in control or should be a leader. Those people are tending to support Trump. But there are many, many people who don't like Hillary Clinton or the Democrats who just can't abide by the things that he said about women. Fascinating. Three weeks to go. Dr. Reinhardt, thank you very much for coming thank in. You. Thank you. Now, here, the number of people out of work has stayed the same, but the the number of new jobs being created has actually slowed down, according to employment figures released today. In the three months leading up to August, the UK jobless rate held steady at an almost 11-year low of 4.9%, but the number of new jobs created dipped by 68,000 over the same period. The owners of Wix hardware stores have announced plans to close more than 30 branches across the UK, that putting 600 jobs at risk. Builders Merchant and chain owner Travis Perkins said uncertain trading is to blame for that decision. However, the radio presenter Tony Blackburn will return to Radio 2 next year, eight months after the BBC took him off air, after he was named in the review into sexual abuse at the broadcaster. 73-year-old who previously said he was made a scapegoat by the BBC said he cannot wait to get behind the mic again. By the end of today, we will be one step closer to knowing if there really is life on Mars, with the European spacecraft Chapiapelli due to land on the planet this afternoon. Chapiapelli will be monitoring wind speed, humidity, pressure and temperatures on Mars before it's joined by a UK-built rover in 2020. Well, science correspondent Alok Jha is at uh, Airbus in Stevenage this lunchtime, where those working on the Mars rover project are anxiously awaiting today's landing. So, first of all, tell us what's going to be happening this afternoon, Alok. Well, in about two hours, Schiaparelli will hit the top of uh, the Martian atmosphere at about 15,000 miles an hour. And then, hopefully, six minutes later, it'll be in one piece on the surface. It's a mission that um, has been decades in the making, and I'm here with one of the designers uh, of the mission. So uh, tell us, how are you feeling today after all this time waiting? Excited with some trepidation. It's quite hard to land on Mars. Oh, in the past, missions have only had a 50% success rate, although now they're better. But in those six minutes, the heat shield has to protect it, the parachute has to fire, the rockets have to turn on, turn off at the right time, and then it gently drops to the surface and a crushable structure protects it. So not guaranteed by any means. But this is just the beginning of the ExoMars mission, isn't it? And this rover we can see behind us is the kind of thing you're going to be sending in a few years' time uh, as part of the next part of the mission, isn't it? Exactly. So today, the first one is performing this key element of landing. And then in 2020, we'll be sending the ExoMars rover built right here at Airbus and Stevenage. And it's looking for signs of life. So it's got a two-metre drill that drills below the surface to find a sample that's protected from the sun's radiation. And on board, a whole suite of instruments to look for evidence of life, life markers, or even current life, microbes or bacteria. So the very first experiment to actually look for life and that will happen in five years' time. Uh, but within two hours, by about four o'clock this afternoon, we'll know if Schaffer has landed safely on the surface of Mars. Alok and guest, thank you both very much.
And finally, for most of us, running a marathon would take mental determination, physical endurance and a certain degree of fitness. But it's all the more impressive when you are well into your 80s. 85-year-old Ed Whitlock has not only just completed the Toronto Marathon, he smashed the world record as he did it. Suzanne Verdi has his story. Hidden in this crowd of marathon runners is the fastest 85-year-old in the world. Ed Whitlock ran the Toronto Waterfront Marathon in Canada in three hours and 56 minutes, setting a new world record in the 85 to 89 year age group and smashing the previous one by more than 30 minutes. I don't think it's one of my best world records. It's a matter of um, perseverance, I guess, patience. Ed, who was born in London, is still proudest of running a marathon in two hours and 34 minutes, back when he was in his 70s. It's a record that still stands. Uh, when I was 73, and that was a, a magic day. So what next for the man known in running circles as the master? Hope to set the 90-year-old record. Hopefully I'll still be running then and can attempt then. If Ed's inspired you, don't worry, you don't have to have the latest designer running gear. He did it all, wearing 25-year-old running shoes and a 20-year-old vest. Suzanne Verdi, ITV News. And just a quick reminder of our main stories this lunchtime. The Home Office has rejected calls for dental checks on child migrants arriving in the UK. And a former pensions minister has told ITV News that it will cost the former BHS owner, Sir Philip Green, hundreds of millions of pounds to rescue the store's pension scheme. And that is it this lunchtime. Mary Nightingale and Mark Austin will be here with the ITV Evening News. The news where you are follows the national weather. But for now, from all of us, bye-bye and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.